Good evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Madison. Tonight my guest is Tolani Sotash, the ANC candidate for mayor of Cape Town. Municipal elections are only a month away and it's widely agreed these are extremely important elections. But the focus hasn't been much on local matters, it's been mostly national. Kolani Satash was an activist from a very young age. He was 14 when he got involved with the Fingo Student Congress. Uh, uh, so he was working already in the apartheid era. He's now 44. He's been on the uh, city council in Cape Town for 15 years. He's chairperson of the sub-council 24, which is uh, four wards in Kailicha. Um, he's a former deputy leader of the Provincial Youth League of the ANC. And um, I want to welcome you to Between the Lines. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. Um, Kolani, your publicity material says you strive to bridge the divisions between rich and poor. Your opponent, the mayor, says she already taxes the rich to support the poor. In concrete terms, how would that change, how would you change Cape Town? Well, I think, John, uh, firstly, we must acknowledge that uh, Cape Town is divided. Yeah. And uh, we must strive to unite people in Cape Town to speak with one voice. You don't actually normally invite people to a house and then you say, look, just greet each other and then that's unity. Your actions in terms of resource allocations must speak to your vision. What is it that you want to do in Cape Town? We must be able to, to, to deal with the issue of the apartheid special planning for, for, for this city. Because Cape Town was in an advantage even before 1994. But the ANC were in charge for a while. Why didn't they change it? Well, um, I'm not sure when you say the ANC was in charge, whether in terms of the city or in terms of the country. But if you say in terms of the city, the ANC only governed this city for two years. And mm. I'll be able to articulate why I'm saying that. If you go, no, back, yeah, if you go back to the history of uh, this unicity, the ANC took over from the DP, I mean the Democratic Alliance in 2001. And um, there was a partnership between the ANC and the NNP until 2004. When the ANC won elections uh, in 2004, all those NP members became ANC members. But, but how would you change spatial planning in Cape Town? Well, it's very simple, John. There are pieces of land that we have here. They belong to the state. And the cooperation between the spheres of government is very, very critical. Develop those uh, pieces of land for mixed-use development. You're talking about places like Cullenberg and Wingfield and District 6? Well, there is, there is a piece of land that is in commons here in Rondebosch, uh, pieces of land in Wingfield, the one that you have referred to. Yeah. And uh, there is also a piece of land near Constantia that belongs to the state. Yeah. And um, also your Dinell. We have to really deal with the issue of, uh, of that land so that we can be able to... That's the Wingfield land. That's right. That's but right. now why hasn't that happened up to now? Look, there were clear plans in terms of making sure that there is a development of integration. But unfortunately, uh, when the DA took over in 2006, they shelved all those plans and come up with a different approach in terms of the city. Because if you look at how the city is being developed now, it's actually extending in the periphery of the CBD instead of trying to bring the workforce next to the workplace. But isn't the blockage at the national level, those, that the national government has to free that land? There's no such. I mean, as I'm talking to you now, national government has engaged the city of Cape Town around the issue of denial. The city is resisting. And one of the things that I know very well, the current mayor is very good in terms of misleading the society. Do you think that the differences have been uh, bridged differently in ANC areas like Johannesburg, because you still have Soweto in Johannesburg, Alex is still poor, Santon is still rich. If you look at the issue of Johannesburg as we speak, and especially the township that you have mentioned, uh, uh, Soweto. Soweto is not a township anymore now. It's been actually changed completely. It's a city. I mean, if you go to Johannesburg and in Soweto, People in Soweto now, they talk about facilities and other issues. The issue of housing is not an issue anymore. And it shows you that uh, when the ANC took over this country in 1994, there was a, actually an aggressive um, uh, infrastructure development to make sure that those who were uh, oppressed in the past are getting access to the, to the resources of this country. So settling people was the key for the ANC because at that time, um, even the working class, they find it very difficult to, 
uh, have a shelter and then the government unlocked all those opportunities for people to access. So there's a huge difference between a Cape Town, judging also from the influx both these cities are getting. I mean, people are coming in numbers. The issue of... Uh, and coming of, in numbers yes, to Cape Town they, as well as Johannesburg. They, they go, they're coming in numbers in Johannesburg and Cape Town. The, the, the issue of urbanization, we can't avoid it. Right. So be, these big cities must have clear plans in terms mm -hmm. of how we are going to make sure that we cater for people who are coming here. Because this is a free country. People are free to go wherever they want to go here in the country. We, as politicians, who are given a mandate by people to look after their affairs, we must make sure that in our actions, we do accommodate these kind of uh, actions. But, you know, even independent observers feel that Cape Town is, by and large, better governed than the other cities, and that, uh, and of course, the auditors gen general, auditor general reports generally give Cape Town a much better, better re uh, report than most of the ANC-controlled cities. Well, John, the issue of the clean audits, uh, you must actually transfer, I mean, uh, look at the clean audits and also look at the material conditions on the ground. Yes, we don't dispute that uh, in terms of the administration, the books, they are doing very well. The ANC laid a very good foundation. But let me say to you, Cape Town is the, we have two cities within a city here. So what the DA does when uh, resource allocations are made, and especially around the affluent areas, they are making sure that they spend those resources in a, you know, a, a meticulous way. So that at the end of the day, whatever they have to account to the treasury, uh, it, it actually reports. But if you go to another side of the city, that is the poorest of the city. So because we are saying here, you've got a city for the rich and a city for the poor. The, the conditions are still, are still the same. I mean, if Dula Omar today can wake up today, he's not going to get lost in Gugudetu. He's not going to get lost in, in Atlon because nothing has changed. But if he comes here in town, you can see the kind of infrastructure that we have put here in the CBT. Um, compare this infrastructure with the infrastructure that we're putting in the, but, in the but, poor areas. But what would you do? Would you increase rates on the rich to pay for these things? No, no, no. John, there, there is a, there, there is a, a kind of a, a, a working relationship between the spheres of government and the partnership also with the private sector. We don't have to really tax people that much to respond to the issues of the infrastructure. The city does have uh, money now. I mean, when the DA took over in 2006, the city was financially sound. We had uh, over 2 billion rand in reserves. Uh, currently, I think that has gone up to 8 billion rands. So why do you then uh, tax people to, I mean, when you know very well that at least you are financially sound? So it doesn't make sense. Thank you. We, we need to take a break. Don't go away. And we're back with Kolani Sotash, the uh, ANC candidate for mayor of Cape Town. Um, Kolani, you spoke recently at a SAD2, a teachers' union meeting. Um, what do you say to critics of SAD2 for blocking attempts to improve education by allowing inspectors, not stopping corruption enough? Isn't it so that some of the unions are not playing as unmixed a role as they used to, that part of what they do is good for, for workers, and part of it is not always good for the country. I, I think uh, the, the approach is very simple here, John. We need all stakeholders to come to the fore to help the country in terms of educating its society. Because if we do not invest in our youth, this country is doomed to fail. So there is a role that the organized labor must play. There is a role that the uh, uh, government must play. Somewhere, somehow, there will be serious contradictions, but those contradictions must not compromise the education of our kids, because this is the future of the country. But doesn't leadership require us sometimes to challenge uh, uh, forces that are going wrong in the unions or wherever they are? No, of course, government will raise issues when they are not uh, uh, happy about how the organized labor is responding to issues. And also, I think unions have a right in terms of the constitution of this country to lobby and advocate for the interests of the educators uh, in terms of how they are coming up with, the, I mean, in this partnership with government. So you will always find these kind of contradictions, but those contradictions must not compromise. All of us, our interest is to make sure that we've got a better country, a better country that invests in its youth. 
You know, uh, when I look at the problem in South Africa, jobs is, is really one of the very, very biggest. We're losing jobs. We've just had another report this week. One of the ways we could start creating jobs as well as pride would be for us to start, for government to buy South African made products, for instance, cars. So many of our leaders are driving these fancy cars made all over the world, but not South Africa. Would you commit to, if you become mayor, to, be, to buying South African cars made by South African workers? Well, let's start with the issue of uh, the country that is actually facing the issue of recession. I mean, it's not only South Africa that is actually facing the issue of uh, economic crisis. Across the world, I mean, countries are really uh, facing the... the but the, we're doing the, worse than the others. Yeah. So I, part of our problem is local. Part R of our remember, problem we're, we're, local. remember we're a developing country, and then um, we are striving to be a better country. So what happens elsewhere, it will affect us, because those uh, trades, partnership with those countries, it will reduce our exports in terms of what we produce in the country and also what we buy from. So I think the issue of proudly South Africa that you have raised earlier, it's a way to go. I mean, we must always encourage to make sure that we promote uh, our own production so that once we promote our own production, we'll be able then to get more I, I, I mean, attraction from other countries. Will you commit to buy South African cars and have government buy South African cars? Remember, we are not a country in isolation. We are a country that works with other countries. So the issue of trade, uh, partnership with other countries, it's, 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 it's very, very important because if then we just focus on South Africa, we are not doing anything about but then, other export, I mean but, other imports. But then proudly South Africa doesn't mean anything. Well, proudly South Africa, we are saying there must be a particular percentage that people must focus on in terms of buying a product for the country. But it doesn't mean that we must not trade with other countries. But South Africa makes beautiful cars. Why don't we all just say, we're all going to buy? That would create jobs tomorrow. Well, I mean, John, as I'm saying to you, we, 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 we have actually started to do that, to say that, look, what we produce in the country, we must be able to really sell out to other countries. So the point that I'm driving home here is that we can't be only confined with South Africa. We have to partner with other countries in terms of boosting our economy. But of course, I agree with you that uh, the country comes first, the production of the country must be promoted so that we attract more investors to our, our, I mean, to our country. Right. Now, um, this week there's been a controversy in the press about the fact that the, uh, uh, the DA, the Democratic Alliance, has been running an advert uh, that uses Nelson Mandela's name. Uh, I, I, I assume, now the ANC has objected to this. They've said uh, the DA should not use Mandela's name. Why not? John, this is very opportunistic. And then you can see that this is a party that is very desperate. In fact, it actually tells people of South Africa this is a party that is very bankrupt in terms of intellectual capacity. Because Nelson Mandela, as much as he is an icon of the world, Nelson Mandela himself, he told everybody that when he leaves this country, in terms of passing on, when he arrives in heaven, he will look for a branch of the African National Congress. <laughs> so Mandela that we're talking about today was made by the African National Congress. So we can't divorce him from the ANC. But if, but, but if, if, if Nelson Mandela were, were around today, would he be proud of the national... ANC that we have today? Well, ANC is a bigger organization, John. I mean, year in, year out, we're getting more people that are joining the African National Congress. And but the opponent polls are showing you're declining. Well, it's a big church. It's a big church. It's bound to have its own contradiction. But leadership, what we can actually uh, 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 appreciate is the fact that the ANC does not shy away from its challenges. It, it does respond to its challenges. Mandela was unequivocally in support of press freedom. Can you honestly look the, our viewers in the eye and say the SABC is, is, is run as a, as a press freedom organization? Well, as, I mean, SABC has got a board, John. It's got a board. Well, it's a non-functioning board. It's, it's, it's not a, even a legal board. Well, it's a board. The ANC does not run SABC. SABC has got a board that is actually all South Africans have participated in terms of uh, uh, nominating those individuals that are in that board. 
So what we need to do then, because if the ANC as an organization so now, they're not will ANC, go there and uh, take a decision about what needs to happen, the ANC will be blamed at the end of the day. Allow the space for the board to run its affairs. Isn't the board uh, deployed by the ANC? No, well, I mean, all those members that were there, they were interviewed by the parliamentarians. Parliamentarians are coming across, I mean, from all political parties. So, so it's not, not an they, ANC deployment. They're not deployed? They are not deployed by the ANC. Those individuals that are there, they went to a particular process. And that process was actually uh, uh, confirmed by all the political parties in, in, in parliament. But in 30 seconds, you would agree that what's going on there is really, uh, really a serious problem. It's not being well run. Well, all I'm saying, John, let's allow the SABC to deal with its affairs. And then as a country, let's encourage those who have been given a responsibility to run the affairs in the SABC to take the country into confidence. But we can't at any given stage when whatever happened in any entities in, the South, in South Africa that is placing the doorsteps of the African National Court as if the ANC as a party is running those enti entities. And we need to take a break. We'll be right back. And we're back with uh, Kolani Sotash, the uh, Cape Town mayoral candidate of the African National Congress. Kolani, th the opinion polls show the party, the ANC declining. Uh, all the opinion polls we're showing are, are showing it declining everywhere. Why is that? Well, I, I'm saying, John, I mean, uh, you know, sometimes we need not forget as, as the country, these polls, they come up with their own opinions in terms of the samples that they take across the country. But what matters the most for us as African National Congress, when we go to elections, we always emerge victorious. Isn't it that sweet? It is. Because people are allowed to have their own views about uh, the image of the ANC, whether the ANC is still standing its moral ground and so forth. But at the end of the, a of the, end of the day, the ANC does have a capacity because it's mass rooted. So we don't do our work on boardrooms, on cameras. We do our work by interacting with people and listening and listening to people's uh, uh, problems and respond to, to them accordingly. It's the same, you don't see these polls after the elections. And they don't come and say, no, sorry, we were wrong. And um, I think some, somehow uh, there is a kind of an approach that project the ANC as this uh, devil organization that people don't like and all that kind of stuff. But the reality, if you look at our election campaigns, wherever we go, people are more attracted to the African National Congress. So we are not bothered that much about the views of people who are saying that, no, the ANC is losing support and so forth. There were a lot of uh, suggestions that in 2014 elections, the ANC will drop below 60. It will, some polls suggested that the ANC will be at 55%. And, 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 you know, it, it, it sends shockwaves across the country. The ANC surprised everybody. And I did not see those who were running those polls coming out and saying, sorry, we were wrong. <laughs> right. If uh, Cape Townians vote for you and you become the mayor of Cape Town, what kind of a, um, an ANC leader are you? Are you a leader who supports uh, the president when he says Nkandla was fine, or when he said it was wrong and he apologized, or when he said he wouldn't pay, or when he said he would pay. Which ANC leader are you? <laughs> There's one ANC, John. There are no too many ANCs. But the ANC's um, positions keep changing. No, no, no. The, the ANC is an organization. We can't... Uh, 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 I mean, the message of the ANC is very simple on the matter. The issue of Gandla, we have addressed it as, a, as an ANC that allow all those who are responsible to process the issue, to process it, once it's processed, and then uh, we must be able to respond. At, 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 at least now, I can be able to say, when the ANC was saying that, allow parliament to process this issue, allow public protector to process this issue, we as an organization do not want to interfere with that. At the end of the day, the, the president agreed to pay, and then the president is going to pay because Treasury has decided what amount must be paid. But hasn't there been a lot of damage to South Africa in the years this debate has gone on? Look, John, I mean, uh, there are people who have tried, you know, to dent the image of the ANC because of what is happening. But the ANC has been consistent in terms of its messaging. 
that this is our approach. The approach of the ANC has never changed. It has been one that allow people to process those because the ANC will be accused again as an organization. If Comrade Gwede Mantashe will come with his uh, colleagues from Lutuli House to come and tell those who are in parliament what to do, what not to do, the same community will be accusing the ANC of micromanaging government. So what the ANC has done, it had allowed government to run its affairs, it allowed government, I mean the entities to run the, uh, the, I mean the chapter nine institution to run their affairs. And every time that the decision is taken by any of these uh, 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 entities, the ANC has always, always complied with those decisions. Now, in your election documents and in your interviews, you've said that um, you want to be a bridge between all sides in, South Af in, in Cape Town and between uh, the different tiers of government. If you don't win, will you still be that bridge between local government and national and, and provincial government? Well, the, the bridge is not actually directed between the spheres of government. The bridge is directed to people of Cape Town. Here, people are living in fear. Uh, they are living in fear because if you go to Cape Flats now, people, they don't know whether the next day they will be alive or not. When you come to town, they don't know what kind of insults they will get from different races. So what we are saying, let's have an open dialogue as a society. What kind of a Cape Town we want? Do we want Cape Town? that is a Cape Town that is black and white, or do we want Cape Town that is one Cape Town, one people speaking with one voice? We must acknowledge that there are inequalities in Cape Town. How do we respond to that? The resources that we have must be directed to those disadvantaged communities so that they have a sense of belonging here in Cape Town. People must not feel that they are not welcome in Cape Town, yet they are contributing to the affairs of the city, they are contributing to the economy of the city. Those who have must understand that we are not saying that we will take everything that they have and be subsidized to the poor. We are saying the infrastructure that they have, we will continue to maintain, but we need to review our priorities. Where are our priorities? It can't be correct that in the same city you will have a very extremely rich people and on the other side of the road, very extreme poor people. It can't be. So we must have a situation where we are saying we speak with one voice. Let's make sure that the issue of this uh, wide gap between the rich and the poor must come to an end. Polani So Tash, thank you for being on, on, uh, on the show. Uh, finally, uh, the, book, the book I'm recommending this week is Fordsburg Fighter, The Journey of an MK Volunteer by Amin Kaji, as told to Terry Bell. Um, it's an easy read. It's about one of the first volunteers to join Mkonto Wesizwe in the early 1960s. There are a number of books like this coming out, and they're important because they give us an insider view about what it was like uh, um, in those early days, and also a more re realistic idea of what the ANC could and could not achieve. I mean, Kaji was trained in Czechoslovakia. He was never well used. He ended up very disillusioned and opted to stay in England. Um, where he and his family have settled. But he has made his peace with people in the ANC and people on all sides of the um, ANC uh, uh, activity have, have, have endorsed his book. I recommend it. Um, that's our show. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Golani Satash. Good night and happy reading.